This is a hard episode to comment on my, in my usual format, because, uh, well, this is a comedy. So, you know, it's comedy. It's funny. You know, kind of jocular tone. Um, <clears throat> I do find this episode very amusing. They've been wanting to do this kind of thing for a bit, and this seemed like a good time to do it, and I agree. It's also nice to have a legitimately lighthearted episode, given how dark and serious most of Season 6 and the beginning of Season 7 has been. And given how the la latter part of Season 7 is going to be, yeah, that makes sense, too. <laughs> so we see a Vulcan with a bias. Now, this is going to sound very strange, but this actually makes a lot of sense to me. To see a, for lack of a better way to put it, specious Vulcan. No, seriously. This actually does make sense to me. And not that the Vulcans as a whole are like that. We've seen plenty of decent Vulcans over the years. But to see a Vulcan like that. Yeah. No, that's completely heh, logical to me. It's one of those interesting concepts, uh, something that's been talked about recently by a friend of mine. The idea that someone could be an otherwise decent person but have a fairly glaring negative you know, character trait, like you know, being effectively a racist, because that's what this Vulcan is. I, 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 I have seen some people argue this over the years. I, I'm sorry, I can't see any other interpretation. He has clearly been dragging Cisco through the mud and hammering this point on for years for no other reason than to constantly exemplify how superior the Vulcans are to the humans and to continue to rub it in the human's face, using Cisco as his go-to for how to show how illogical and inferior the humans are. I'll, c I'll circle back around to that point a little bit later, but for now it's just interesting to see this kind of a thing. I imagine this is the kind of thing that Roddenberry would hate, actually. And I don't necessarily blame him for that, because, again, this is not a good thing. And the episode makes it clear, this is not a good thing. What I find more interesting is how much it's tolerated. Although, again, considering that this is his one flaw and the rest of his stuff is fine, maybe that's why people just kind of look over it, I don't know. It's also possible that Cisco's never really become open about it, which... You know, I, I could see that. After all, he never even told Dax, Curzon, or Judzia about this situation, even though it's been going on since the Academy. So, I mean, this is a long-term thing. So they decide to go ahead and learn the rules of baseball. <laughs> I have a story about baseball, but I'll save that for a bit later. Because it's weird to think about how complex the rules of baseball actually are. Baseball, excuse me. Because, I mean, the basic gameplay is actually fairly simple, if you sit and think about it. The problem is there's a lot of variances on exactly how that works at what point in time, depending on circumstances. Over the years, the rules have become more and more complex as things happen. That's, that's how that works in sports in general. Every sport gets more and more rules as more and more circumstances require them to have a ruling. Almost every one of those rules is something that has happened because of the event already happening in a game somewhere along the line, and someone jumping in and saying, okay, now, going forward, dot, dot, dot. So, I do love seeing them going back and forth and, and trying to, to struggle with the terminology. <laughs> Rom wanting to get involved is rather heartwarming, I might admit. Not just because he's the lovable person, and not because he's Rom, but because of the fact that his reason for doing so is he wants to spend more quality time with his son. I like that. Nice touch. And of course, that's why Lita wants involved, too. Their reasons for joining are very pure, very heart-driven. And I want you to remember that, because it's going to come up later. So we see the Niners, haha, versus the Logicians. Cute. <laughs> what I like most about it is there's this really tiny tidbit where, uh, I forget which one, one of them has a Giants hat on, the other one, uh, oh, what was it? The Giants at that point in time were sharing a stadium with the 49ers. The 49ers. It's a really subtle touch. What's also amusing, and I wrote down a couple of instances of this, they actually bothered to really look into the rules. The rule that uh, Cisco was quoted by Odo, uh, you know, section 4, paragraph, whatever, that was a real rule, and that's the actual position it was in, at least at the time of the making of this episode. Uh, it has since been moved... And in fact, several rules have since changed since this episode went live. Like I said, rules change and develop over time in sports. But it's interesting to note that they went through this level of effort to be genuine to the sport. 
which I like. And I know this is a weird place to point this out, but I point this out because this again brings up why I was so disappointed by the the battle in the episode whose name I can't think of. One moment. I'll just look it up here. Uh, that would have been... Come on, where is it? Tears of the Prophets, I believe? Yes. That would have been the episode Tears of the Prophets. You know, the one that I spent several minutes explaining how incredibly stupid they were being and how much it irritated me. If they had just brought in a military tactical advisor or consultant, they could have done that. And I bring that up because that's exactly what they did here. I even wrote down his name. Joy Banks was the baseball consultant they brought onto the show for this episode. Because, like I said, those people exist, especially in the late 90s, that, where Hollywood and television are such established industries that there are whole sub-industries built under them, including consultants. So they brought in Joey Banks, and they actually looked into it, and lo and behold, they made an episode that's actually pretty adherent to baseball. In fact, there's only one thing they do that is not adherent to baseball rules, and that's when the Vulcan decides to go and hide in the dugout because he didn't actually touch home. So, that's it. Other than that, everything else completely lines up with the rules. And I'm okay with that because it was, it was a neat little scene, and it was amusing the way they portrayed it. They could have been following older rules. That's entirely possible. We know Cisco is fond of uh, an earlier era of baseball that's actually shown all the way back in Emissary. They also apparently brought in actual professional baseball players to play all the Vulcans. Go figure. It kind of helps to show why they actually... The idea was that when they filmed it, they would actually be doing well at their job, which was actually the exact opposite problem they had with a few players, including Max Grodenchik, who, in fact is actually a pretty good baseball player who played in high school and thought about playing pro until he went into acting. And he was having so many issues with portraying himself as a bad baseball player, he decided to switch hands, uh, playing offhand, basically, in order to try and you know suck more at the game, since that was the whole point of the thing. I just find little tidbits like that rather amusing. So uh, Cisco gives his big pep talk. It's awful. It's entirely focused on winning, which makes sense, given what we know. Although the team is probably a little bit like, huh? Okay, sure. And of course, then they go to the infirmary, where everyone's there, and Quark is having just recovered from surgery. Worf's not even present, because they're going to go see Worf, and Grodenchik's like, excuse me, Rom's like, tell him I'm sorry. <laughs> Love that little bit. And, um... <sighs> There's this nice bit that shows that Cisco's just kind of pushing a little bit too far. And it shows how much this is bothering Cisco. And that makes perfect sense. It really does. I want you to think about something. If you've been bothered or harangued by someone consistently for probably in the range of 20 years, I mean, don't you think that would bother you every time it comes up? Especially if you're given an opportunity for... Uh, I hate to say revenge, but that is pretty much what this is about. Although, I'll bring, I'll circle back around to that topic, too. So, he's really pushing for us, and he kicks Rom off the team. Now, I mean, there's a logic to that. Rom sucked, but Rom was here to spend time with his son. And this is where we see that contrast, that Rom was just interested in hanging out with his son and having fun, and Sisko was only interested in beating Sovak, or Solvak, or... Oh, God, I forgot how to pronounce his name. Give me a second. Solok. Solok. There's no V in there, Laura. So, the team shows surprising... Uh, no, not surprising. Shows expected solidarity. Every single one of them backs Rom, saying, Nope, we won't play. And Rom's like, No, no. It's okay. You go ahead and play. I'll, I'll cheer you on from the stands. But, okay. <laughs> So we see a few more, like I said, there's not much to comment on for a lot of this, because it's just it's just funny little scenes, like, you know, the chewing gum that's been infused with scotch. <laughs> God, that would taste terrible to me. That's like, oh God, can you imagine black licorice chewing gum? I bet that's a real thing, actually. And we see Odo being like, safe, safe, <laughs> practicing in, in his office. That's just hysterical. But then we get to the scene... <laughs> where he gives us all the background info, that this isn't just the latest incident, or this isn't just a, a isolated incident, excuse me, but that this has been going on for some time, that Solok has been needling him since the Academy, everything I already told you about. Now, 
I bring that up because, first of all, like I said, it does make sense. Vulcans claim to be non-emotional. That is a lie. As I've said many times, Vulcans actually have extremely powerful, extremely violent emotions that they spend constant hours and much of their upbringing training themselves to control and restrain. That's a Vulcan. And the, the best of Star Trek has acknowledged that particular point. What we're seeing here is that Solok really is, well, let's say he's deriving satisfaction from the way he continues to provoke Cisco and the way Cisco always falls for it. <laughs> like, just picture Solok going, <laughs> and it actually fits surprisingly well. Because he's literally trolling him, provoking him into a response by portraying himself as the injured party and then laughing when the other person does the expected response. It's messed up. I'm not trying to say otherwise, but you'll notice... You'll notice most of his team doesn't seem to share that. In fact, they seem to just kind of be into the game. You'll notice even the rest of the team is actually at the party afterwards, the celebration party. They're not, you know, being loud or demonstrable, but they are, you know, enjoying themselves in their own particularly Vulcan way. I point that out because that was also something I always got the impression of, that this is all on Solok. That his team was just, you know, his crew, basically, was just kind of going along with it for the enjoyment of it. I could actually see a Vulcan enjoying baseball, legitimately. There's, a, you know, In fact, I could see a Vulcan enjoying a lot of different sports for the same basic reason. The chance to push oneself, the precision and the control required to really do particularly well, um, the amount of things you have to keep in mind. I mean, tr try explaining offsides to someone, just to use a, an example from football, for example. But the point being, I feel like this is the kind of thing that's interesting and makes a lot of sense, it is Solok who's kind of taking this game and twisting it and perverting it into something else. Which is funny, because Cisco is then doing the same thing in reaction to this. Now, of course, he admits all of this to Cassidy, who then, jump cut, immediately admits this to the rest of the team. And they're like, dude, screw this. This isn't Cisco's fault. This is Solok's fault. He's the one who's been pushing this way too long and way too hard. And they're right. So they decide to show solidarity. First of all, did you know the Federation had an anthem? I didn't, until this episode. It's kind of a boring, dull one, too. Go figure. Anyways. And eliminate the spectators. That, that amused me, actually. Because, obviously, that makes it a lot easier to film. It's a lot easier to maintain consistency and to have better audio balance if the, the crowd isn't there. Second thing I found amusing. Worf's calls are very Vulcan throughout the whole thing. I think Klingons would like these kind of sports, too, by the way, if, if the rules were adjusted a little bit to add a little bit more uh, blood, if you follow me. <laughs> In fact, there's this bit where a Vulcan uh, basically collides with Kira, I believe it is, in order to get her out of the way to, to hit the base. That actually was legal at that point in time. I bring this up because that's one of those rules that's since changed, because it was causing too many injuries to players, because, I mean, you come barreling in as fast as you can and literally bowl them over to try and interrupt them. So, yeah, they got rid of that. Now imagine a Klingon version of that maneuver. <laughs> Just like bull charge right into the person, right? I'd pay to watch that. Uh, that actually brings me to the next thing I want to talk about. Um, how many of you ever watched baseball games in real life. Now I'll go ahead and raise my hand on this. I'll never forget a story. My dad and I once, uh, as part of work, were going to a baseball game. I believe it was the Giants. I'm not actually sure, but don't quote me on that. It was the Sacramento um, Arena? Ballpark. There we go. It was the Sacramento Ballpark, whatever that one is. And we were there, and it was, the, you know, it's the top seats, right? The really big, fancy one where they have catering and the, most of the games being shown on the TV screens. Oh, and you can also leave the, the area with the alcohol and the food and, and the people kibitzing. And you can go outside and actually watch the game if you want to. Well, Dad and I were there. Everyone, no one was actually watching the game. None of those people were. <laughs> and Dad and I were both like, what the heck? So we just went outside and ended up watching the game together up there. We had really good seats, you know, way up and plenty of view. And, yeah, you know, it was fun. But at the same time, if I'm being 100% honest, I only really enjoyed it because I was there with my dad. I've never really enjoyed watching baseball. So as much as I was like, you know, what the heck, the hard truth is 
that's kind of an unrelated problem. I, I don't find baseball enjoyable to watch, and I know I'm not alone in that because I've talked about this to several other friends before. You know what I find interesting, though? I find baseball a lot of fun to play. I was actually on a lot of baseball teams back as a kid, local teams, not nothing serious, nothing professional, just, you know, uh, the school or the, the after-school club or whatever. We would get together and we'd play some softball because it was fun. Because I actually enjoyed playing. I would probably play today if, you know, I had the time and, you know, didn't have a bad leg. I'm not even sure I can run at this point in my life. It was fun to play. Now, I bring that point up on purpose. I'm not just trying to tell you a boring story about me. Because, well, that's kind of the point of the episode in a way, isn't it? Cisco sees the, the final maneuver, the, the, the going into the dugout maneuver. And he says, that's what I love about this game. And, and Rom says, yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. And Cisco's just like... And there's like a two-second pause as he's just like, God, I'm an idiot. And he's like, Rom, come here, come here. We need to fix this. Now, what I love about the structure of this is usually this kind of structure is, we okay, the underdogs who have something to do with ducks and say quack, quack, quack a lot for some reason, go up against the big, serious, we're all about winning team. And then they start off bad, but then they bring in their pinch hitter and it kind of evens out and it all comes down to the one big play and then they win. Well, this is the ninth inning, and they're down uh, 10, I think. Yeah, that's not happening. They've lost. They are gone. But that's not the point. They have lost the game, but they have not lost. As Cisco realizes at the end there, he has been playing Solok's game for 20-plus years. He has been playing by the rules dictated by his enemy and in so doing has fallen victim to what so many of us have fallen victim to over the years, falling into trolls, bullies, and otherwise unpleasant people, by doing what they insist on doing on their terms, and in so doing allow them to dictate the course of the encounter. So Cisco was losing the game. But then he sends out Rom. He brings back the crowd. That made me grin. Can I tell you another quick story real quick? I I'm going to truncate this one because it's actually a really long story. Uh, I was trying to do an achievement in World of Warcraft once, and it, it required me to walk into Iron Forge. I was a Horde character. And in so doing, simply by doing so, I was flagged PvP. Now, I don't want to PvP, and I don't care about PvP, but um, that's not fair. I used to PvP a lot, but the, I'm getting off topic already. Point of the story. As I was leaving... Two Alliance characters tried to kill me. Now, they failed because I, I knew what I was doing. But the problem was, at that point in history, as long as you were still in combat, you couldn't actually mount. And this was before flying was out of This was before Cataclysm. I'm uh, pretty sure this was during Wrath. So I couldn't fly to get out, and I couldn't mount uh, because the guy was following me. Uh, so two of them are following me. One of them vanishes. The, the other guy who vanished flew ahead to Loch Modan, and then the two of them tried to pincher me and narrow down. Now, I was playing a tank, a warrior, specifically, protection warrior. Now, when they narrowed in on me, I was like, okay, this is it. They're going to kill me. Because I refused to give them the satisfaction of trying to fight back. All I'd be doing is playing the game on their terms. I'm not going to try that. I'm not going to do that. I've been there too many times. Again, you know, bullies, right? And trolls. So... Having managed to get all that far, I noticed the something. See, your PvP timer, unless it's re refreshed, falls off after five minutes of non-PvP activity. So even as they're beating on me, I targeted myself to ensure that I didn't even accidentally target them back, which meant my timer was still ticking down. So as they're nearly killing me, I got down to very low health. I forget exactly. It was like 5% health when the timer ended. And the two players are like swarming all over me. Really, really confused because, you know, they, they couldn't kill me because I stopped being PvP flagged. So I got up. I, I forget if I waved or bowed, but it was like, ah. And then I hearthed out. I call this the perfect revenge because the point is I didn't allow them to drag me down to their level. Instead, I won by redefining what winning means. And that, I swear, I swear this is relevant, that's why this is relevant to this episode. Because what Cisco and his team did was they redefined the goal. They redefined what they were trying to accomplish, and in so doing, they won. 
They called it manufactured victory, but that's mostly just going along with the whole thing. No, instead, what they did was they had fun, and they scored a goal right at the end of the game, and they enjoyed it, and Rom was embraced, and they won. They lost the game, but they won their objective. They had the perfect revenge on Solok. And when Solok comes in, of course, he can't handle this because, well, he's used to the game being played on his terms, to things being done as he defines them. They have changed the definitions on him, and he's trying to reestablish control of the situation by mocking them, by belittling them, and it fails miserably because, well, they're no longer playing on his rules or terms. So they just all have a good laugh at his expense. He even makes the mistake of allowing some of his emotion to seep out, and, in so doing, calls them human, when in fact they have something like four non-human members on the team. Hang on. Kira, Dax, Rom, Quark, uh, Nog, Worf... Hang on, it's... give me a second. I think we got a few more. Never mind, they've got a lot more non-humans than I thought just showing how far he has lost control of the situation. So he gets a very wonderful comeuppance. Rather than going for the somewhat unbelievable, they win at the last moment kind of a thing like they could have, instead they go for a far more believable, we won what we were going for. We went out and we enjoyed a ball game. I've always had a private headcanon, and I like to think that in the future, in the rest of Season 7 off-camera, Every now and again, the team would get together again and have another ball game, just for fun. I like to think that. I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts on this episode. I'll see you next time, guys.